you awake? I thought I heard you get up. Yeah, I'm awake. Sorry, I just can't sleep. Are you thinking about... about him? Yeah, a bit. You should get back to sleep, my love. I'm fine. No, no, it's okay. What else is on your mind? I don't know. It seems weird, but I had one of the most vivid dreams of my life. I saw a fox on a snowy mountain, just looking confused and worried. Those eyes. I can't get those eyes out of my head. She was running in the windy snow, looking for something. Do you think it has to do with... with you and what's been going on? I don't know. It was just a dream, Rachel. They're not meant to make sense. A lot's happened the past couple days, that's all. Well, if you're not going to sleep anyway, you should tell me. I want to hear. All right. So, not far from her home, she followed that path to something unexpected. She couldn't stay, though. She had to find her other two children. So she took that path. She followed it towards something ancient. Something with answers. The fox looked high and low searching for any sign of her cubs. Points of light showed the way to this ancient tree. It was as if each one had a story to tell all their own. The land was trying to tell my story too. I felt like I was right behind her the whole time. As a kid, did you ever do show-and-tell in your class? Yeah, I, I think I only did it once, when I was in the fourth grade. You know how my life was around then. I wanted to show my class what helped pass the time and distracted me, so I brought a dozen paper cranes I had made. I think I told everyone how badly I wanted to be a bird and fly, embarrassingly enough. Don't be embarrassed. Every kid wants to fly. For me, it was another toy for my dad, a wooden boat. I remember guarding it so carefully in my hands as I walked into class. When I sat down, a group of boys immediately made fun of it. They asked which trash can I found it in, or why an ugly log was my favorite toy. When I got up, I didn't even want to tell them my dad had carved it. I said it was a joke gift my friends had given me. Kids can be so cruel. Some of them are. I shouldn't have let them get to me, but it did. It's amazing we bounce back at all.
Usually those kids would leave me alone, but somehow they could tell I was different. They made fun of how far away I lived. They called my dad a sourdough. I was a blabbermouth as a kid, telling my dad stories I made up for hours. But after that show and tell, I didn't tell him much anymore. He didn't know exactly what was wrong, but his best guess was that the toys he carved weren't cool enough. He carved me a tank and tried to tell me what it was like to be in a real tank as a serviceman. I didn't know your dad was in the military. Yeah, in the army. The sad thing is that I'd pretty much forgotten until just now. There's so much I still don't know about him. I'm sorry. He knows how much you love him. You're going to see him again soon and have some closure, I'm sure. I asked myself, why talk to anybody anyway? Why bother when I'm happy by myself? I started drawing a lot, mostly animals I saw in the woods by my home. I then imagined designing my own hideouts with things like TVs and pantries full of chips and cookies. I think that idea of leaving home and drawing blueprints started my career. I found a lot of solace in that. I'm not surprised, but I did the same thing, you know? There is something special about having a place to call your own. And now look at us. Well, if you count renting in an overpriced city. <laughs> it's as close as we can get for now.
here, Jack? <laughs> That's one way of putting it. If wood was a canvas, then a carving knife was his paintbrush. Even after working a 50-hour week, even after his hands were more splinters than sister's skin, he would bring home the nicest piece of Alaskan weeping sea and make me toys. That wooden train was the first toy I can remember, and I loved it. I just knew from a young age I was going to be a lumberjack, like my father. My teenage years were full of sketching, angst, and trouble. I wasn't popular or unpopular. Maybe just forgettable. I guess that gave me a sense of freedom. So I hung out with crazy kids, doing crazy things, even though I mostly just watched the chaos ensue. We did it all. Put fireworks in mailboxes, hide roadkill in people's garages, break windows of the barber shop in Anchorage. My dad was furious, but he was so busy working he couldn't do much to stop me from going out. I think being an adult means there's no one to stop you making hard decisions. He had to make a living, and he couldn't be in two places at once. Yeah, I realize that now. But at the time, I was sure he was more interested in growing his business than what was going on with me. working another late night, and my friends were over, saying how bored they were and how they had come all the way out to my house for nothing. One of them mentioned how that old, ugly beyond belief truck was still in the garage, and how we should take it for a spin. I was only 15, so I kind of fought it for a while. The next thing I knew, we were careening around the mountain path, rocks spitting onto the sides of the cliff while my dad's cringeworthy bluegrass blared out the speakers. I drove while my friends were in the back of that yellow and purple truck, throwing beer bottles and trash at anything remotely interesting. Felt like I was soaring in the air with borrowed wings. But all good things have endings. A cop outside of Eagle River pulled us over after he saw us in a bottle rocket into someone's yard. What followed was a long night of talking to disappointed adults and feeling smaller than ever.
After he drove me home from the police station, I blew up at him, saying how I never wanted to be like him, how I was going to be someone and leave that hick icebox for good. He just looked forward at the road with tired eyes. I took out that bluegrass tape from the cassette deck and chucked it out the window. In my sage teenage wisdom, I thought I had proved the ultimate point, but my dad had a different idea. He slammed the brakes slowly bowed his head while gripping the steering wheel and finally looked at me. All he said, like it was a polite request, was, make this right. I sat there in silence, fuming, but I eventually got out and combed every square inch of the woods, muttering profanity after profanity. I found it 30 minutes later, near a small waterfall off the road. I went back to the truck, Put the wet tape back in, and sure enough it worked. We didn't speak another word to each other the rest of the night. Wow, I knew you were a crazy teenager, but... It's hard to believe, isn't it? it? Surprises me too. It's like I didn't really know who that kid was back then. I bet my dad thought the same thing over and over. It's almost like he was saying, make this right to himself, more than to me. friends would laugh about that night, and talk about how crazy it was, and I laughed along, pretending it didn't bother me. But it did. I imagined my friends growing old in the bush, unable to find that thrill in those godforsaken ice fields. It's like those mountains were a literal wall, keeping me from leaving, where all I would have to look forward to are lumber yards and evening beers. I had to climb over. That was my only goal for a long time. If there was some way I could take my love of drawing and turn it into a way of escape, nothing would make me happier. I wanted to create instead of tearing trees down. I wanted to move to the lower 48, not because I hated it there in Alaska, but I hated the idea of it. It's like all of that spite inside me had created this monster which followed me around my whole teenage years. I put so much energy into doing what others didn't expect of me. Why did I do that? There's one fact you're forgetting though. 
If you didn't have that fire in you, we probably would have never met. You're absolutely right. Maybe the destination is all that matters in the end. But then why am I awake? Why am I seeing this fox go on her journey? And why can't I stop thinking about my dad? On our property, there were old abandoned pieces of a shed and car long left unused. I used to ask him all the time who those people were that left all this junk, and I'm sure he got so tired of hearing it that he made up some elaborate stories how a brown bear ate them and haunted the woods afterwards. What's funny is I think it made those people seem more real, growing up thinking they were still hanging out like they couldn't say goodbye. I used to tell my friends how I could swear I saw spirits move near the water, and that always freaked them out. I guess it didn't bother me, because the way I saw it, they were normal people with old cars and sheds, just trying to figure out how to survive and be happy in the middle of nowhere. It was a cool thought that they didn't want to leave, but you know, I was a weird kid. Well. You had good company since those ghosts like living in a place where they were brutally devoured. <laughs> Even at my most distant, at the times when I detested him the most, he kept reaching out. For a year straight, he asked me every week when we were going camping. I thought he was just dense. Eventually, to shut him up, I agreed. We carried out the worn lawn chairs from the garage and set up a cinder block campfire at the site we'd always used behind the house. We walked down the mountain path talking in the warm sunshine we only got a couple months of the year. Those three obsidian rocks shimmered alongside the shore, 
almost like sparklers pressed against a dark window. I'll never forget that wet stone on my feet, or how those massive mountains looked even bigger in the lake's reflection. I felt small, but grateful. As the sun set, my dad found something I hadn't seen for a long time. The tree where I'd made my first carving when I was six. I hadn't even carved it. My dad had helped me, but I still called it my tree. Something about seeing my name there made me open up, and we talked about everything that night in that old camouflage tent. I told him how much I loved sketching and design, and how it would be a dream to study architecture in Seattle. I told him how I didn't get along with my friends much anymore, but that I didn't mind being alone. He told me he was there for me, and he joked that if all he had to do was write my name on a tree to finally get me to talk, he would have left me carved logs with novels on them in front of my room every morning. <laughs> I don't know why it took me that long to realize it, but it was then I knew how much he had sacrificed for me. He wasn't watching fly fishing or reading Tom Clancy novels, he was carving something. He made tons of birdhouses. Not that he was into bird watching, but I think he really missed working and adding on to the home. If he couldn't afford the time to build onto our own house, he would have to settle with watching birds move into their little homes. We kept an old mattress in the bed of that ugly yellow truck, so we would drive it deep into the woods and then watch the birds fly into their houses while the sun set. Usually it was accompanied by venison jerky or a cold coke, but not a lot of talking, which is how we both liked it. We were happiest underneath the evergreens. We decided it was time to finally map out the hundreds of acres we lived on just to pass the time during the summer. He was only free in the evenings, so I would spend the day wasting time on dial-up internet and sketching, and then we would rush into the woods, pen and map in hand, before evening fell. Sometimes the aurora borealis would cast a cold green glow on the mountainside and we would finish our route underneath a twilight sky. Sometimes I was lonely during those summer days, but there was comfort in the routine. A lot of teenagers aren't looking for the daily grind, though. There's nothing wrong with wanting to get out, to leave your childhood home. You wanted to progress, to make something of yourself. Yeah, you're right. That house. I'm sure it's the same as how I left it. Then why does it feel so different? I doubt you're the only adult to have looked back and asked that question.
stood nearby, unfazed, like nothing was wrong. My dad is dead, and he's never coming back, Rachel. I can tell you these stories, but I can never reminisce with him again. He can never hold a grandchild that we'll probably never be able to have. I can never talk to him again, and I'll never be able to say I'm sorry. For everything. Joseph, you can't go to sleep feeling like this. I'm sorry for everything, and I know you need space, but I'm here for you. 
You don't need to feel so lost. Joseph, have I ever told you what my mother was like? watching the birds in the morning before the school bus came. <laughs> I thought that my mother was one of those birds, and it made me want to be free like her. My mom taught me how to fold origami creams while she was in the hospital, so I told myself I would fold one every day until I could fly myself. I think we both have always loved animals, and for me that love started with a dog. Sometimes this Rottweiler would come up to our property line and wait at the fence for me, but only once in a while. I was sure to check every day immediately after school, and it usually ended in disappointment. I would even steal money from my passed out dad just so I could buy these off-brand dog biscuits. Even when she did stop by, she never went beyond the fence. Why was she so scared? I think my dad was the opposite of your dad in almost every way. Except he was in the military as well. He coped with alcohol of every kind. The trailer started falling apart, he got angry, and I withdrew. More and more I became the weird, quiet kid who made lots of origami birds and carried talk biscuits around. I think we were pretty similar when it came to being the weird kids. And that same sincerity in college was one of the reasons I was so drawn to you. Life got worse and worse, and at one point, I really didn't think I could survive another day with my soul still intact. I had no real friends, let alone neighbors, since we lived in the middle of nowhere. I should have talked to my teacher, but I was scared what he would do if he found out. As I waited for the school bus one morning, I walked around until I found something in an abandoned shed. Something I can't put into words. summoned courage I didn't know I had, and I broke into my dad's room and found the key to the shed where he had locked my bike. I'll never forget that feeling. The wind rushing by my ears as the sun rose over fields of wheat. I was flying for the first time. I biked as far as my legs could take me until I found a house that felt friendly, and that felt like home. Those strangers helped me in so many ways. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have found my foster family. And if it wasn't for my parents, I wouldn't have met you. You have strength, Joseph. And you're not as alone as you think. It's all just so pointless. Just waiting for life to happen. It's like having the home I always wanted is cursed out of my reach. The thought of being a parent myself. How could I do that when I couldn't even be a good son? I'm sorry. I know what you're saying. I just don't know how things will work out. These quiet hours will turn into years. We'll wonder which roads passed us by. Then we'll forge a new road, together. Besides, I discovered for myself that one fateful morning where any hopeful road leads to. There may be thorns and mists, but it always leads to the same thing. And what's that? Family. I'm so glad 
that you're part of my family, Rachel. And I'm glad you're part of mine.
The fox knew her last cub would be waiting for her at the first tree. She was almost there. The rain cascaded onto the jade valley where the entrance to the tree was. Life was protected there, because that's where life began. It was now only a mother and a daughter left. Items from my life still dotted the ground as she moved closer to her destination and destiny. school, I felt something I hadn't felt in a long time. Drive. I looked into the best architecture schools on the west coast, then got a dose of reality when looking at other students' portfolios and the high cost of tuition. I still wanted to be something, to be the next Alvaro Siza, and to make those thousands of sketches worth something in my grand history. But now even an internship sounds impossible. Siza helped me understand how essential emotion is in architecture, and he also said light is the real composer of space. I like to think these glints of light, like not finding a job, or even a strange dream about a fox, are something I should be thankful for, even if the illuminated space is something I'm less than comfortable with. super supportive with my college plans. To a point. Things were okay until this terrible accident happened. I guess a forklift flipped over due to a bad axle and it crushed one of the workers there. My dad didn't eat for days. Even though he wasn't directly involved, it devastated him. Not only did it hurt the business, but it just freaked him out. He would talk in his sleep, muttering things about firing people and saying sorry. One fateful day he approached me, said that since my school search wasn't going well, I should finally be a man and take over the family business. He said one day he was going to die and that all of his work, sacrifice, and even that man's life would be wasted in vain. I just lost it. Teenage me just exploded at the thought. I screwed up, I said things I shouldn't have. He was having a crisis, and I pretty much spit in his face.
Was that the last time you talked to him? No, I called on holidays, and he would call on my birthday. I guess we acted like nothing ever happened, which was stupid. I didn't want to ask about his lumber yard, and I'm sure he didn't want to ask about my job search. I never went back and visited. I think the last conversation we had was about what movies we had seen, and what exactly a best boy is in the credits. I thought he would be here so much longer. In the distance, the first tree illuminated the weight of the weight of the wasteland. She couldn't go home anymore. She did the only thing she was capable of. Moving forward. My dad died alone in the middle of the wilderness. I should have been talking to him more. I should have done a lot of things differently. If the first tree on earth brought life with it, if it taught the birds to sing and fly and showed saplings how to grow, what could it do for us? received yesterday from a name I didn't recognize with a quote I can't stop thinking about. Death is not the opposite of life, but a part of it. More and more, I'm realizing one important truth. Each of us have our own journey to the first tree, but sometimes I'm not sure I'm ready to take that first step. You already have my love.
It's only a dream. A distraction from tomorrow. I don't think dreams normally bring back to memory so many important feelings. Maybe it was just a dream, but it was also a gift. Yeah, I suppose. But tomorrow we're getting on a plane to the last place on Earth I want to be. The only person that would have made the trip worth it is gone. You're going to see him and be with him one last time before you say goodbye. I have one last quote for you by Emerson, sealed in an imaginary letter from me to you. It is the secret of the world that all things subsist and do not die, but only retire a little from sight and afterward return again. Go to sleep, my love. We have a big day tomorrow, but I'll be there with you every step of the way. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Good night, Rachel. Good night, Joseph.
hell? Thank you. 